if you guys have a question, I won't be offended if you interrupt. You can type a question in the chat. Uh, uh, if maybe Tom can help with that. And uh, yeah, we want to, we don't, this isn't just for my ego. Uh, it isn't for my ego. We want to, you know, get you guys to feel like you, you, you got, you learned something. And we don't want anybody to leave here ignorant or confused, definitely not confused. All right, so with all of that out of the way, then what are we here for? What's the topic, the lecture topic for our first in this series? So we're going to start with discussing the basic machine learning tools, Python, NumPy, Pandas, and Jupyter Notebooks. So if you want to do machine learning, you're going to have to know these tools. Okay, there's no way around it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say a little bit about each. If I can figure out how to change to the next page. Let's see. Oh, there we go. Okay. All right. So, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about each of these tools and try to convince you why you should learn to love each of these tools. Maybe not so much Jupyter Notebooks. You'll see why at the end. But definitely, you have to learn to love Python, NumPy, and Pandas. There's just no way around it. Okay? So let me now discuss Python and what's going on with that. So let me start with probably a, a, a statement that's not controversial. All right, so everybody here, I assume, wants to do programming if they haven't already. So if you've done any programming, you quickly discover that programming is hard. And because it's hard, it takes a lot of time. And because time is money, it's expensive. And it is also slow. So if you tell me you have an awesome idea for a machine learning startup and all these wonderful things you're going to do, so, you know, God bless you. I hope you're successful, but I know you're going to have struggles. You're going to have funding issues. You're going to have your investors are going to want you to get things done by deadlines, and that's going to stress you out. And then you're going to have bugs you didn't anticipate. So that's just the nature of the beast with software. All right. So if we accept that, then what do we do about it? Okay. Well, how about making a language that helps us now that we know that we should be somewhat pessimistic about how difficult it is to create software? So let me ask this question. How would you design a language that was as easy as product and productive as possible if you didn't care about execution speed and resource requirements? Now, you might say, well, yeah, well, why wouldn't you design a language that's as easy and as productive as possible? Who wouldn't want that? Well, it's not that people didn't always want that. It's that they wanted other things in addition to being productive and easy. All right. That's why at the end of this question, I, I said, well, what if you didn't care about um, two other things which come up? So a lot of times people will say, I want my program to be fast. It has to be fast. I, I just want it to be the fastest, okay? Or also, I want it to not take a lot of memory or not require a, a you know, big computer to run. So let's, I'm not, and I'm going to address those. So I'm not saying those aren't valid concerns, but what if temporarily, what if we just, we ignored that for a minute and we just said, if we were designing just completely for human comfort, we're going to, as much as it costs, whatever computer memory we need, let's just make the nicest language. And that's the absolute only thing we care about. All right. So let's all brainstorm together how we would do that. Well, how about compactness? So what I mean by that is, I don't know about you, but personally, it's really annoying to have to look at a C++ uh, reference and see this just hundreds of pages of all this stuff I need to know in order to say I'm a C++ language expert. Um, so languages, learning languages, I just want to, you know, learn the 
what I need to do to get my work done. And so can uh, let's make a language preferably that has has a, a, a limited vocabulary, but a very powerful vocabulary. OK, it's going to give us the best stuff, the, the, the good stuff, what we need to 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 make our startup uh, be a unicorn and and we're going to remove all distraction. OK, now. Not all languages are like that. So, as I said, C isn't like that. Perl isn't like that. Now, if you're wondering, so does that mean the, the creator of C and Perl, were they crazy? No. Again, people have other goals when they design a language. So, for C, the goal was not only to make an object oriented version of C, but it had to be compatible with old. C code. So you have basically C embedded in the language C++, and then you've got all the, the new object-oriented uh, features, the templating system. And so really, it's like two languages merged into one. So that's why it's such a mess. And then also, they wanted it to be fast in addition to being as easy as they could make it. So they had that those conflicting tensions. Uh, Pearl, you might say, well, what's going on there? So I've met the creator of Pearl at a conference. So Larry Wall, he he loved he had his motto is there's more than one way to do it. So he he wanted to let's let's put all the paradigms, let's put all kinds of versions. Everybody has their own style, and let's just make a big tent language. And so uh, yeah, we wanted that's what he considered his ideal language. And so that's why people say uh, Pearl is a uh, uh, what do they call it? Write, write once, but also read once, right? You, you come back to your code and you can't understand it. So we don't, we don't want to go there. All right. So we're going to do the opposite of that. Just the minimum because we don't want to waste time and learning languages is painful or it is for me. Okay. Also going, uh, related to this idea of let's make it as small as possible. Let's just have a few high level data structures. There's lots of patterns that show up over and over again, and we want to have support for these common patterns. We don't want the language to be so primitive that we don't support common patterns, but we don't want to have too many of them. Like again, we don't want the C++ reference textbook that's hundreds of pages. So let's get the best functionality and let's only add that, okay? And so what, what are those high level data structures? I'll go ahead and elaborate now. So a list. Now, you're, you're gonna agree with me that this is a, a very powerful general data structure. So a list is a, col a collection, a collection of objects. How often do you have to use in your software a collection you wanna group more than one object? All the time, right? So. Let's definitely put list in our ideal language and let's make it, let's just be able to, you know, throw in not just one type, but multiple, uh, um, multiple different types. So you see here an example, I made a list call, called A and the first element of the collection is the, an integer, the number two, and then I have a string, hello, and then true a Boolean it's called. And then after that, I even have a, a list inside a list. Okay. So you could, you can, you can nest lists as deep as you want. So clearly everybody is going to need collections. So we're going to definitely want to have lists in our ideal language and we're going to want to have methods to do all the obvious things. We're going to need thing uh, methods to insert new elements, to remove elements to nest lists as well as several other features, which I'm going to show you in a demo. I'm going to, I'm going to elaborate more on lists and show you more sample code is what I mean. Okay. Now, so lists. So, okay. So we, we like, we need collections. How do we access pieces of the list? So a list you access by the, by its position. Okay. That's called an index indexing. All right. Sometimes we want to access our data by some other means than position. So we have, we're going to have to, or we're probably going to want to add dictionaries also called hash tables and other names. 
but let's add a data structure where we can access data not by the position, not by an index integer, but by a name. So here, and that, again, that's a very general uh, uh, requirement or useful feature. So we'll want to add that to our tiny language. So here I made a dictionary called A, and I'm, I'm storing capitals of states. I just have two right now. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to access that data by the postal code for the associated state. All right, so that's another very common requirement or desire. And again, we're going to want methods to add, remove, nest, do all kinds of wonderful things with dictionaries. All right, and then we're, Python has those. It has lists. It has dictionaries. It also has other data structures, but really not that much. There is what's called a tuple. That is a, you can think of it as a, a list that you can't change. Okay, remember I, I showed you, the, you, I said you can add new elements to lists. With tuples, you have to always make a new tuple. If you, like, if you want to add an element, you make a new tuple that has all the old elements copied and then a new element added. There's sets, that's, think of, that, think of it as like a list where there's no uh, repeated elements, they're all unique. And then classes, if you know about object-oriented programming, you can, you can de practically design, you know, essentially, def yeah, define your own uh, data structures with classes, all right? So with that short list, we can pretty much do, uh, you know, everything we're gonna need. And the evidence is lots of enterprise companies have created massive, successful products with this wonderful, simple language, all right? We don't need, again, we don't need their C++ reference textbook. All right, what are some other nice features since we're dreaming here? So, if you've ever used a language like Java or C++ or C, you know about, you have to compile the language, so you develop, first you, you make, you, you develop your source code, then you have to, to test it, you compile it, then you run what's called the executable. Let's avoid that. Let's just, let's just run our source code. We don't want to, yes, it's, it, it, it's compiled under the hood into, uh, what's called bytecode, but let's not, we don't want to bother with that, or we want it done automatically. Again, because our goal, our goal is not because we love computers and we're taking a class and we want to learn computer science. It's because we, we want to get work done quickly. Now, if you want to, to take off and run with analyzing what compilation means, certainly you can do that. Um, you can analyze Python, but that's, doesn't, that's not always going to be our goal. Most often, it's not going to be the goal. It's certainly not the goal uh, or for, how, for designing py how Python was designed. We want everything to be as quick and easy, I said. Okay, memory management. So, we want to avoid memory management. So, you, you probably know that computers have RAM and the data goes into RAM, and so your software manipulates that data in the RAM. And so, old languages, you used to have to manually say, okay, I'm done with this data over here, so you can use that memory for something else. And so, that's called memory management. And that if you do it yourself, like C and C++ and Rust do, you could make very fast code, all right? But that, again, that's not our goal. Our goal is just to make everything as quick and easy and automate as much as possible, okay? Remember, we don't care uh, about speed at the moment. We wanna just make it as easy as possible. Avoid crashes. So if you've ever programmed in C, it's you, your program will just mysteriously crash and create what's called a segmentation fault and you don't know why. Uh, let's make a language that if you do have a bug, it'll say, okay, fine, let's, we have a bug, don't, nothing to get too excited about. Let's just gracefully leave the program and print a lot of useful information to help you fix the problem, all right? So that's called uh, raising exceptions. And then we want to avoid issues with different hardware when we move code. If we want, we want to be able to run it on a Windows machine, on a Mac machine, on a supercomputer, on a Linux 
uh, virtual machine and we don't want to have to bother with porting that that's not interesting to us or or maybe it is but but uh, again we're just our goal is to just make things as easy and automated as possible and python has a virtual machine that um, deals with all those those uh, issues of running on different hardware all right now this one used to be really controversial i don't know if it's that as controversial anymore but Python, you don't have to declare the types of your variables. So if you've used Java, uh, C, C++, lots of other languages, you have to say, okay, I have a variable called V, and I'm going to declare to everyone that this is an integer, or this is a, an object, or a, a string, or character, whatever, all right? And so people will say, well, that makes your code it's it's a security wise you when you compile that helps you to catch errors and they'll say it makes your code faster because the compiler knows your intention it knows your type okay well again that's that's all wonderful but that takes more work that that it takes more hassle to get the the declarations correct furthermore again we are we are aiming for the stars all of those declarations of your variable types, that's just more clutter in your visual field of your editor, all right? That, that, it's more noise. That, in my brain, I, I can only think of so many things at the same time. So let's automate that away. Let's automate this uh, also, automate it away. So what Python does is it, it can tell, for example, if you say uh, x equals 3, Python's smart enough to say, oh, okay, he meant for, he wants X to be an integer type variable. Or if you say S equals, quote, hello, end quote, okay, he wants S to be a string. All right, so, I mean, it's not, it's not a mystery how you would develop a language to do this. And this, this, is, this is so wonderful, all right? So you don't have to bother with types, declaring types, that is. Python still has is what's called a strongly typed language so every value every object still has a type in there okay now having said this if you talk to other people you might find some diehard people that'll say no i still like declaring all my types and i have my reasons and they'll tell you the reasons well and there'll be a, there'll be a list and there'll be other things there they care about in the uh, in addition, again, to ease of use and uh, being as productive as fast as possible, which is fine. Okay, people have different needs, but right now, I'm, I only care about making things as easy and comfortable for me as possible. Openly admit that. Okay, now, let me say a little bit more about automatic uh, type declaration. So here I have an add function. It, this function accepts, this is how you define a function in Python, by the way, if you didn't know that. The DEF is the keyword to define a function. And then this just has one line that returns X plus Y, where X and Y are the two uh, arguments. All right. So if you did this in another language, you might have to define one version where you say, okay, the X and Y are integers. So I'm going to state that. I'm going to compile my add function. Everything's great. And then if you wanted to have floats, maybe you have to have another version. You might even want to have string concatenation. So you can, X and Y could be a string like hello world. And so then it would return the scrunching those together, concatenating them. And so you'd have hello world would be the answer. That's perfectly fine too. That's a, that's, you can consider that addition, okay? And in another language, you might have to specify three or more versions of the add function. Whereas here, look, I'm just specifying the structure. All of those types will work fine. Okay, so much less code, so much less in your visual field to deal with. Okay, so that, that is a wonderful feature, which I've loved for 18 years. Okay, now, Again, as I said, this used to be controversial uh, when it was uh, relatively new. It's uh, 
let me just say a little bit about some objections. So, well, I like declaring types because then when I compile my code, I can, I, it'll catch the errors for me. Okay, but when you run Python code, either you don't explicitly compile your code, it just runs, it looks like it appears to run your source code. You're, it'll raise an exception when you run your source code. So it'll be, you'll have runtime errors instead of compile time errors. So you'll still catch the bugs. It's just at a, a different phase, that's all. Okay, also, if you're still bothered and well, you know, I just, I just really like to be safe and secure, you can always add unit tests to whatever it is that you're worried about missing in your code, okay? And again, you can have, you can probably find debates with people online. You can probably find YouTube videos on the pros and cons of each. And so let me just say that the, the evidence, the, the, the market has spoken. So large groups have successfully developed massive enterprise applications in Python, as I, as I think I said already. All right. So regardless of what you think, this works, right? P dynamic typing works. Uh, it doesn't make your a big programs crash imploding on themselves. All right. Also, uh, we definitely want to always have clear code. In fact, we would prefer not to make it possible to write bad code. Okay. Now I can't, Python can't do everything. It can't turn a terrible programmer, you know, into uh, a 10 X programmer, as they say, but there is a few things it does. It removes a lot of noise, a lot of clutter from the visual field. One, uh, I believe it's unique to Python. Actually, there was Fort, Fortran was a very old language that also dealt with white space in a, in a special way. Um, that's a conversation for another time. But Python forces you to have clear indentation. Okay, so let me go to the next slide. So here is uh, an if statement, a conditional statement, conditional block. So if the sum of a plus b is greater than or equal to four, only then and only then do I want to double the value of A, set B to four and print that string, okay? Now, in lots of other languages, if you had what's called a block of code, this block for this conditional if statement, you would have to define it with braces. You, like JavaScript, you'd have to end every line in your block with a set or statement with a semicolon. Okay, we don't have any of that. Why just indenting it is is sufficient. Again, less clutter, less to worry about, less to get wrong. Also, with languages that you use braces and semicolons, you are able to not line everything up. Okay, if I don't know why you'd want to, maybe you do it by accident, but you could have those three lines under the if, the first line, you could have them all starting on different columns and make a mess. And your code would still run, okay? But Python doesn't let you do that. So um, that's kind of nice. Why do we wanna have freedom to do, you know, something that's not good? Why would you want your car to let you put it in reverse while you're going down the freeway and blow your transmission? That, that's silly. Okay, so not, not all freedom is necessarily desirable. Okay, now also a few more things. We want to avoid duplication of effort. So Python has a massive standard library that's included with it. So probably anything you're doing, whether it's web development, um, you know, writing a word processor, doing data analytics, certainly machine learning, there's probably a library that's very uh, stable, very, very mature that you can use. Now, it gets even better. You can also easily call libraries in other languages, okay? So we're, we're trying to be as flexible and useful as possible here. Now, all right, so we designed our perfect language Everything is as easy as possible. And so what could go wrong? What, what could we possibly object to? Why don't we all drop everything and go run and learn Python uh, immediately? 
Well, the number one worry that people have is what Python is too slow. All right. My pet language that I learned in school is really fast. And so what if I write my program and it just takes days to run, whereas maybe the C code will take seconds and I'm going to be waiting around and this and that. Oh my gosh, what if my code is too slow? Okay, so yes, we like easy languages, but what about this concern? All right, let's address it head on, shall we? Okay. Are you sure that your language is too slow? All right, so what do you mean by slow? If your C program takes one second, but your Python program takes three seconds, who cares? Do you care? Does it matter? What if you only run your program a few times? What if you're just prototyping and you're, you're, you just want to, you know, maybe you're learning about uh, some algorithm, so you're just coding it up for fun and you're going to run it a few times and that's it. So what, is, what does it matter in that case? Um, are you interacting with humans or networks? So, for example, if you are making a GUI application, graphical user interface, so your humans are going to be interacting with your program on their time scales. So your program is going to be waiting around a lot. Somebody's going to click a button and expect a pop up maybe to show up in a few microseconds. If you make, if you're, if it takes, let's say, ten microseconds instead of three microseconds, they're they they're not going to notice. I don't know what the what the the the, the what do you, what do you call it? I don't, there's a limit there. Eventually you'll notice, but if it's if it's a difference between a few microseconds, probably people won't even notice that it's a little bit slower because of Python. See what I'm getting getting at? Also networks. If you're if you're making like a peer to peer program, a program that's uh, a server that's going to be t making connections to a lot of nodes, a lot of machines on a network. So you are at the mercy of those other computers. Maybe you're sending data and you're waiting for data to come back. All right. So there's latency involved. It's not everything isn't re dependent on the speed of your program. Your program, just like the, the GUI example, is going to be doing a lot of waiting for other people, other things. Okay. And so Again, you could make your program 20 times faster and it wouldn't, you wouldn't even notice. That's what I'm getting at. This is why I asked the first question. Are you sure it matters? Are you sure that it's too slow? And then I already said, um, will your, maybe you're just going to run your program a few times. Maybe you, uh, you uh, this happens a lot too. You create a program, you show it to your boss. Eh, yeah, that's nice, but I really actually, now that I think about it, I really wish I had these other features instead. So now you have to throw it away, go back, write the next iteration. It comes back, okay, yeah, change this. You see what I'm getting at? And there's this back and forth. So all of those throwaway versions, it would have been a waste of time to make them the fastest program in the world, right? And then here is a little uh, bold suggestion. Uh, it is expensive to hire developers. Let's say a developer, I don't know, let's say $50, $60 ish an hour, eight, let's say 500 ish a day. And then your company has to hire and then the overhead and the matching fund 401k. You can imagine it costs about a thousand a day for a developer. So a thousand a day, thousand a day, every day, developing your program to make it as fast as possible. Are you sure? It wouldn't be faster to just maybe spend a little, maybe $10 extra on your Amazon Web Services cloud account, get that upgrade to that faster CPU uh, virtual machine. All right. That's not against the rules. Again, we're trying to get work done as fast as possible. Get your startup to get that product out the door as fast as possible. Uh, the goal is not to be as macho as we possibly can. Okay, now, having said that, you, you say, well, okay, that's all wonderful and, and great, but sometimes I do need my program to be fast. So what can you say about that? Okay, so 
if you've ever tried to speed up your program, you may have used what's called a profiler. A profiler is a tool that tells you how much time is spent in each function, how much time is spent in each function. So let's say your program has 20 functions. So you might think that that means, so let's, you might think that 5% of your time is going to be spent in each of those 20. That would five times 20 is a hundred. But often what happens is you have one or two functions where all your time is being spent. Okay. You have the, it's called bottlenecks often choke points. Okay. So you could spend a lot of time making 19 functions really fast. But that one function is where all the time is going. All right. If you spend 10 minutes in one function and all your other 19 functions just take two seconds. Yeah, great. You turned your two seconds of execution into one second, but you still have this 10 minute function. So nobody's going to notice if it goes from uh, 10 minutes to nine minutes and 59 seconds, right? You got to take care of that 10 minute one. In fact, if you make that one 10 minute function faster. Let's say we get that down to, to, to five seconds. Uh, even let's say we get it down to half a second or no, uh, 10 seconds, let's say. Okay. Well, then those other functions aren't really making much of a dent, right? Those other functions I said added up to what, like two seconds, one second. So, so percentage wise now, most uh, uh, now you you pretty much solved your your uh, speed up uh, goals. Okay, so let me give you a true story that happened. So uh, about 18 years ago, I was in a project doing some crypt cryptography work for the government, and I had introduced Python. They had originally done their code in C, and uh, I got the group to start switching to Python, so we ended up coding. So we had coded one algorithm, cryptographic algorithm in C, and we were going to do it in Python just for kicks. And the Python was slow. And oh my gosh, this is going to be embarrassing. Here I am trying to sell this group on Python. Everybody loves me, and this that just right now I have slow code. What am I going to do? Well, it turns out there was one mathematical operation. So there was there was other math, but there was one that was really, really expensive. So what we did, listen to this. So I I wrote that in C. And remember I said you can call other language languages, other libraries and other in foreign languages in Python. So we wrote it in C. We added that tiny piece to our Python program, and it was it was essentially just as fast as the the, the code that was entirely in C. So we got all the benefits of Python, the ease of development, and we got the speed. And we just had we just had to do that one little piece and see. Isn't that great? Okay, so there, there's an example of how you can get the best of both worlds. So you don't want to immediately run to you know some gruesome, painful language and and and, and right from the get-go start worrying about speed. Even if you do need speed, you can still possibly make Python deliver what you need. And, and this is one example. Okay. Now you say, well, okay, that's great. Um, but I, the, your, po your profile example was, was entertaining, but I think I'm going to probably need to rewrite my whole thing in a fast language, like maybe go or rust. Okay. Well, even then you're going to have to first design your program. And if you know anything about programming, that's not a small thing, getting the logic correct, uh, the design that you want. You could design it first in Python and then rewrite it in your fast language. When you rewrite it, you're going to have the design, the architecture in your head debugged, and it's going to be much faster to write it in that painful language. So even then, Python can help you, okay? So don't discount slow languages. Don't... Su don't un don't give yourself undue suffering is what I'm saying. Okay, so l let me now show you a notebook before I jump to NumPy. And here, this is a lot like a um, Python interpreter, an interactive interpreter session. So each box is going to have some, 
some uh, Python code. And then below that, you're going to see the output that the interpreter would give you. Okay. So here you see, I have, I'm creating a list in the first, see if I can make this bigger. All right, so I'm creating a list like you saw in the, in the previous slide uh, called A. It has three different types, so I, I output that. Okay, that's hopefully that makes sense. Below that, I have another one with a nested list like I showed you before. And then below that, in, uh, I'm going to be referring to these boxes by the this IN. There's a number next to it, so this is the third, the third box. Okay, so box three, you see there I'm accessing the the index one so if we start counting by zero so that's the the that'll be the second element this hello okay so that's how you access elements in python uh here is this is i'm, I'm accessing that nested list i'm counting the negative two i'm counting from the right side to get the second to the last element and then uh i'm getting the second element of the nested list inside that second to the last element okay uh, here's an example of doubling a match, uh, doubling a list and adding another list to it. Okay, and again, I, I'll share these all these all this content if you want to follow it more later. Uh, here is an example of adding and deleting an element from a list. In the in box seven, I'm adding an element. In box eight, I'm removing an element. In box nine, I am. I am finding the length, how many elements there are. And then uh, box 10, I'm reversing the order. You can do that as well. Uh, box 11, I, I'm showing you what's called list comprehension. It's, you can essentially make a list with a for loop embedded in it. Here I'm making a list of uh, the first uh, 10 squares starting from zero. All right, and then a little bit about dictionaries, some real code. So here you see, again, the states and capitals dictionary. You see me um, building that, and you see what that looks like in Python when it presents it to you. Below that, I made another one, uh, Jack and Jill. Here, I'm, I'm using the lists from what I just showed you a minute ago. I'm naming one of the lists Jack and one of them Jill, list List A is Jack, list, list B is Jill, and you can, there's no, no reason you can't add a, a list to a dictionary, okay? Uh, below that, I'm accessing, uh, for my states and capitals dictionary here, I'm accessing the capital with, under the, the label TX, okay? Below that, I'm accessing the list I've named Jack and getting the, the element at index two, all right? So you see that? Um, here's some more examples. Here I'm setting an element. So now I'm, I'm, or actually I'm adding a new element to my dictionary. So I, I Googled today, I made sure, so I didn't embarrass myself. The capital of Colorado is Denver. All right, so um, you see that there, I'm adding an element. Here I'm deleting an element. You can find the length, how many, how many key value pairs, as they're called, are in your dictionary, in this case, four. And here you, I'm printing out the keys. Those are the, that's the names of your data elements. And then below that, the values, that's the, 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 the data in your dictionary that you've given names to, all right? And there's lots more I can say, but, it, but let me move on. And so that is my attempt to convince you why you should make Python your favorite language. Any questions on that? Okay, so wait there, I saw one question. Why do some examples have out next to them and others don't? So let me see if I could, oh, so, so it, I'm, that's a, interesting. So it looks like, again, I'm, I, I'm just an, figuring it out now while you, now while I'm on the spot. It looks like that if you print, for some reason, it doesn't show the red out. No, it looks to me like the, it's the print statements that don't show the out. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 
All right. Yeah. No, thanks. I appreciate the question. Yeah, we don't want anybody to be confused about anything. Uh, let me also repeat that this this is this is a notebook. This this is a notebook that I'm running this Python code in. So you would probably write your Python code in an editor like VI or VS Code. And so you this if if this still bothers you, you wouldn't be dealing with ins and outs. Is what I'm saying. Okay. It, it's not a Python issue. It's a notebook issue. All right. So with that, now that we now that we uh, learned about Python. What, what else do we need to know to be a machine learning expert? Okay, so NumPy. So remember I told you that we were only gonna include the, the uh, just the, 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 the few and powerful features we can think of to our general purpose easy language. All right, so as machine learning people, we're gonna have some special needs that everybody else is not gonna have. So one of the weird needs we're gonna have is we're gonna have to do rectangle math. So otherwise known as a matrix or a vector or a tensor, you, if you haven't got into machine learning already, you're gonna have to do lots of math with these big old blobs of numbers and you're gonna have to do all kinds of manipulations on those. So um, we, we, we would like to do that in Python. We don't wanna add it to the the standard language, because we don't want everybody in the world, every secretary and web designer um, uh, and anybody else using Python, we don't want to force all them to learn these powerful mathematical tools. But for us, we'll, we'll, we're going to use it, we're going to package all this wonderful code in a library, and it's called NumPy. All right, so NumPy is your, is your hardcore mathematical library. So. I don't think anybody is going to argue with me that you need lots of mathematics for Python, and so you're not going to get out of using NumPy. I'm sorry. Okay. So NumPy is a powerful library to to handle what are called arrays. You can think of those now that you know what lists are. You can think of an array as either one list or it could be a list of lists or even a list of lists of lists of lists. You can keep going as, as much as you want. And we're gonna have all these structures of either all numbers, you know, all floats, all integers, or even all strings, doesn't have to be numbers. And then we're gonna wanna do lots of operations on those for our machine learning programs and other maybe scientific programs or what, what, what have you, mathematical research, okay? Now, because we're doing lots of math, that we, we can't mess with slow code. Everything I said about not caring about speed, well, we're now, now we do, okay? Fortunately, NumPy is extremely fast. In fact, I will go so far as to say that if you go out and pick your favorite fast language, uh, Rust, Go, C, C++, whatever, and you start quickly hacking together your own little matrix code, your code is not gonna be as fast as NumPy. It's not gonna be as fast, even though you're using a faster language. All right, so what's going on there? Well, first of all, NumPy is written in a fast language. So when you use NumPy, you aren't really using Python. Okay, so you're already using a fast language. It's just that you're using it from the nice interface of, of a Python program, okay? Now, also, why did I say that you're not gonna get as fast writing your own in your favorite fast language? Because if you were obsessed with speed, here's what you would do. Like, let's say matrix edition. You would wanna make code that detected the size of your matrix. And if it was small, you would maybe wanna use one algorithm to add it together. If it was large, you'd maybe want to use another algorithm. Maybe a matrix addition is, is too simple. That's embarrassingly parallel. But let's say a, a matrix inverse or uh, a sparse matrix. Okay, if you were obsessed about speed, you would want to make very intelligent code that could detect if you had a small matrix, a large matrix, a sparse, sparse matrix, and pick the, the fine-tuned algorithm that would make that application as fast as possible. So that's why 
you're not you're not going to do all that with your quick little hack together uh, numerical library that you create. But NumPy, they, they it has it has that for you all built in. A lot of people have spent a lot of time, more man years than you probably uh, want to invest to create a very fast library. Okay, um, in case you still don't believe me, there was there was two projects that predated NumPy. There was numeric. There was num array. One of them was good with with small matrices, small arrays. One of them was good with large arrays. People were using. That's one reason people would flip between both of these at one point. They were eventually merged. Now we have one super library that has all, everything we want from each of these old libraries. And yeah, okay. And again, let me repeat: you are running fast C code when you use NumPy. So don't. Don't be, be concerned about the speed of the NumPy library. The fundamental data structure, there's, there's really one that you need to know at, at, for right now, uh, is arrays. Uh, uh, specifically, what's called ND arrays. The ND comes from n-dimensional. If you've ever taken a linear algebra course, they'll refer to the dimension of your uh, a vector or uh, and other objects as n n dimensional if it's right uh, and then so n dimensional arrays nd arrays and so these uh, you can build nd arrays numpy arrays you see here in my example i remember numpy uh, uh, is a library so i'm importing the library and then in the first line i'm building and i'm building a numpy nd array from a a Python list. That's the 1.1, 2.2, 3.3. Below that, I have a, what's called a matrix, a two by two matrix. Okay, and you see there, that's I'm specifying it by a list of two lists. Each of those lists is a row. Okay, and then below that, I have a array that has three strings. Now, again, let me remind you, you want to have all the types the same. One of the reasons uh, ND arrays are so fast is it they, they know and expect that you're going to have your your arrays are always going to have one type okay fortunately that is often the case when we're doing machine language machine language is your algorithms uh, mostly run on numbers so uh, yeah and so the fact that it all has to be an array of numbers that's that's not a deal breaker it's not a problem okay and like just like for lists and dictionaries, we have a comprehensive set of methods, as you can imagine, to uh, here's just a couple of examples besides the normal adding, adding components, removing components. Uh, you can resize an array, you can flatten it, turn it into one dimensions, you can round uh, the, all the components, you could find the biggest value, the max, the min, the average, the mean, you could do linear algebra, you could do matrix multiplications, you can find inverses transposes if you know what that is okay so if, if matrices uh, tensors if you know what that is if that's your thing then numpy can deliver and the evidence is again a lot of scientists uh, mathematicians a lot of people that do heavy duty work rely on numpy every day okay so you're i don't think you're going to find a better library uh okay uh, just a little bit uh, about accessing values. So you can uh, you can do sophisticated indexing and slicing, right? If you you have you're gonna you're gonna have these these multi-dimensional objects. You're gonna need sophisticated ways to get pieces of it, as you can imagine, perhaps for the program you're writing. So here's one example where I find the row. The, I find the the row with index one of array A. That's the first example. And then in the second example, I have a, I'm getting columns with uh, indexes uh, three, four, and five. Okay, we don't include the last one. And so the first one is to access a row. The, the second one is to access some columns within your your array. Okay. And there's again, there's more sophisticated uh, index and slicing that you can you can use when when you need it. Probably anything you can think of, somebody has uh, you can find a stack exchange explanation for whatever you want to do. 
Okay. Now, let me let me uh, repeat what I said. So NumPy is not written in Python. It look it feels like you're using Python, but you're actually using C, right? Now, and in order to leverage all of those wonderful fast libraries that massive numbers of man hours have gone into creating to, to optimizing uh, arrays that people have optimized, you want to make sure to describe your code at a very high level. Okay, so what do I mean by that? So if you want to, let's say, transpose an array, uh, double the values in an array, there, there's some NumPy method that'll take care of you. And so you wanna just call that API. What you, what you wanna avoid is writing some for loop, if you know what that is, or worse, a nested for loop, and manually specifying, okay, here's what I wanna do, to just walk through every element of my array. Okay, once, once you're talking numbers, specific numbers and for loops, now you're not using all that high level or optimized C code. Now it becomes much more difficult to optimize your program. All right. Now you don't want to be doing all that work anyway, if there's an API that's ready to go. So what I'm saying is you want to try, you want to try extra hard to find that function name, find that person that's used MPI or that's used NumPy that posted on Stack Exchange explaining that and, and use, use that, that NumPy syntax instead of rolling your own for loop, okay? If you do that, you'll be surprised how fast your code is, okay? Now, let me just leave you with one last comment before I show you some examples. So, um, because NumPy has become, well, first of all, Python is, uh, be, is, if it's not the number one most popular language in lots of, of fields already, it, it's certainly the second, or if you look at what's called the Toby index, T-I-O-B-E, it's up there, I think it's the second or first, depending on uh, what day you look, I could be wrong, maybe it's still the second. I think Java and Python are up there, the top two. But anyways, uh, so Python has won the popularity game, NumPy has won the popularity game. Why, why am I saying that? Well, if you really wanna take off and run with your machine learning needs, if you have special fine-tuned needs, okay, somebody has probably created, created a Python library for you, and because NumPy is so popular, they've probably duplicated the APIs of NumPy. So if you learn NumPy, even if you don't use it, you use another library, that other library is probably very similar, probably exactly the same, in fact, as NumPy, okay? You can search and find alternatives to NumPy that are for running on multiple computers, your, your cluster, a massive cluster, and it's, it distributes the workload uh, over all those machines. You can find special libraries for uh, GPUs, graphical processing units, TPUs, tensor processing units, okay? And you will see that a lot of those, uh, the, the API is compatible with NumPy. So isn't that great? So even with, with, with those uh, extreme needs, you'll still benefit from learning NumPy. All right, so let me now show you some example code. And again, if you have any questions, feel free, I, we welcome questions, All right? All right, so here yeah, I'm importing the NumPy module, the library, oops, let me scroll up. Okay, so here I, I'm creating an array named U, and I'm printing the value. Again, I, it doesn't have the red O-U-T, so we, we, we already know why that's the case, because I'm printing. Okay, and then below that, I am, so that a U is, I'm, there, this is one dimensional, so we'd call that a vector, if you know your mathematics. And below that, I made another vector, okay? And then uh, here I do what's called a dot product, if you've ever taken a physics class. Okay, NumPy can do dot products of vectors. Below that, I'm creating a matrix. Okay, and this one's called A, and you see there it's two-dimensional, and so uh, NumPy is nice enough to, to format it for you the way you'd expect from your math class, linear algebra class. Below that, I'm creating another matrix B. 
Okay, I'm using there what's called a list comprehension, that little nice Python feature where you embed a for loop inside a Python list. Okay, so there's another list. And then below that, excuse me, that's an array, also known as a matrix. And then below that, I'm multiplying all the elements of B by three and adding it to A. And you see there, there's the new matrix. And if you, you can do that in your head, triple one of the values of B in some position and look at the corresponding position in A and you'll see that indeed that is correct. Um, here is, in this one, I'm adding 10 to every element. You can just add 10 and NumPy uh, can understand that, okay? You see there all the values got bumped up by 10, okay? Below that, transpose, this is uh, flipping the elements along the diagonal. Okay, so the 11.1, the 11.1 the stay the same. Got to go back up to my original matrix right here. 1.1, uh, 9.1, so that's the diagonal, 7.1. And then the other ones are flipped over that, uh, if you imagine a line going through those numbers. Okay, that's called a transpose. And so, and again, there's, I could go, I could spend hours talking about all the mathematical functions. So I'm just giving you a, a quick taste here by no means. I'm just scratching the surface. Uh, here's what's called a matrix inverse. Okay. So C is the inverse. If you know what, what a matrix inverse's claim to fame is, if you multiply it by the original matrix, you get what's called the identity matrix. Uh, all zeros except for ones along the diagonal. If you look there, you see that the diagonals don't have zero, but instead they have these very tiny numbers in scientific notation. That is not a Python issue or a NumPy issue that has to do with uh, computer arithmetic issue and floating point numbers, which I won't get into. But uh, let's say it bugged you and you wanted to get rid of those tiny numbers. Well, NumPy's got you covered there. So here I'm specifying turn every number less than uh, 10 to the minus 10 into a zero. And then check it out. There's my what's called my identity matrix. There's the ones along the diagonal, and those weird tiny numbers are now exactly zero, okay? So again, NumPy has you covered. And then below that, I'm accessing uh, one row at in row index one. Below that, in input box 34, I'm accessing column two, okay? And you can check that indeed that is column two, okay? And so, yeah, so, um, let me show you some real code here. And when, I'm, when I pull up this code, I want you to keep in mind what I said about needing to do things at a high level, not wanting to, to roll your own for loops unless you absolutely had to. So here, um, if you know anything about machine learning, you might know about min-max normalization. So here I'm taking all my data and in one line, in one shot, I'm just, I'm just completely wiping out all of the elements, bam, min-max normalization, okay? This is what you need to do. You, you, again, you, we don't want for loops. We don't want to waste time with that. Um, here, if you know what uh, one-hot encoding is, in this next one, init data, I am here in this line where it says that's setting outputs. Remember the identity matrix? with the ones along the diagonal. So I'm doing a uh, trick to basically, uh, if you know what one hot encoding is, you're making vectors with all zeros except for ones in different locations. So this is a one-liner to, to do one hot encoding, again, on, on my data in, in one shot, okay? And then there's other operations, so yeah. So this is, when you write in Num NumPy, this is what your code will look like. Very compact, concise, easy to understand, easy to debug, uh, relatively easy, okay? Uh, no, 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 uh, you know, rough and confusing for loops, okay? Um, yeah, so again, I don't expect you to understand everything here, and I'll make this machine learning demo uh, available if you want to study it further, but yeah, this is real. Uh, NumPy code, okay? All right, so if there's no questions on that, let me now go to uh, Python, uh, Pandas, the next thing on our agenda.
So after all those wonderful tools, we got NumPy is going to take care of our math. Python's going to make development easier. What else can we possibly want? Okay. Well, sometimes you need to do more than just deal with numbers. Okay. So that's where pandas comes in. Pandas is, so remember I said NumPy was fast because your arrays, as I called them, they all had to have the same type, be it numbers, integers, floats, or strings. Well, in pandas, it relaxes that constraint. So now we have arrays that can, can have lots of different types. Okay, was there a question? A good operation, so I guess the question is about learning NumPy. So to be honest, the there's so much free good stuff on the internet. Uh, I would just search for a NumPy. I don't, I don't, I don't, I, I don't believe I have a, a textbook on NumPy. And also I could search for things faster than pulling it off my bookshelf if I did have a book. Okay, so Tom says he has a digital book, which uh, he can, All right, all right. So here, there you go. See, Tom is uh, uh, backing me up. So he's he's knows things I don't. Yes. So so there's if you really want a book, you can you can uh, get his resource. Okay. All right. So as I was saying, pandas is is now we want we want uh, lots of different types in our array, but we still want high performance, at least as high performance as we can get for having lots of different types. Uh, why would we want to do this? So data analytics, okay, part of our, part of the new revolution, uh, which is tighter, it's, it's adjacent to machine learning is having lots of data and analyzing it, uh, finding patterns with and without machine learning. Um, that's organizing, doing statistics, that's a term for that is data analytics. So a lot of data analytics, data analysis, data mining is done with pandas, all right? Now, why reinvent the wheel? So pandas uh, was built on top of NumPy. So all those wonderful features and optimizations and man years that went into making it right, uh, pandas leverages that, okay? How cool is that, all right? All right, so just like NumPy had a fundamental data structure, the ND array, so pandas has uh, has two fundamental data structures, a one-dimensional data structure and then an n-dimensional data structure, okay? So the series, a series that's uh, a one-dimensional array essentially, and you see there an example of how you create that, okay? Um, Below that, I have a two-dimensional array. Python calls their data structure for that a data frame. And you see there, I'm using the syntax from NumPy, right? The lists within lists. And so then I put that into that data frame function and it converts that into a, Python, a pandas object, okay? So that's how simple it is. So everything you've learned before in Python in NumPy is not wasted. You're just uh, using more and more uh, esoteric libraries for more specific needs. So your stack of software is, is growing, okay? Series and data frames. And then as you might expect, there's a comprehensive set of methods, lots of string and mathematical operations, lots of data analytics support, okay? Now, um, let me say one last thing to help you. I, I think it's pretty clear what pandas is for, but I think of it as, I think of it as like Python databases. So the data frame, you right, you have this heterogeneous bag of, of values and it's got some, if it's two dimensional, it's rectangular. So it's very similar to a, a database table. Okay, in fact, a lot of data analytics is done with relational data and SQL, okay? So imagine somebody wanted, rather than using SQL, somebody wanted to do Python. Everything they did to their database tables, they wanted to do it in Python, 
Okay, that's kind of how I sometimes think of pandas. And a data frame is kind of like a the Pythonic database table, quote unquote. Okay. So whatever that's worth. All right, so let me now show you some examples of pandas. Oh, by the way, one more thing I can show you. Um, uh, so here I, well, actually, you know what? I will just leave the link here. I had this YouTube video which worked at home, and I don't know why it's work, not working now. Maybe the library blocks YouTube or something. But anyways, uh, you can you can maybe even capture that serial number there you, if you know how to pull the you pull down the YouTube URL. But what I have here is I made a YouTube video of a simulation of electromagnetic waves, and they uh, it was it was like the light source emanating from from a a point source bouncing off a mirror and you can see a nice video of the time lapse and the only reason i mention that here is it was it was all done in numpy okay so that was a very nice uh tool to use for that physics application okay all right so back to pandas okay so here i'm importing pandas again it's a module a library like numpy here you see me creating a series, the 1D array and printing, printing the, okay, you see how pandas prints the value. Now here, notice it's printing the values inside the pandas series, and you also see this other column on the left, the 0, 1, and 2. So what's going on there? So remember, pandas is not NumPy. It's used for data analysis, data analytics. It's a lot, like I said, like a database. So here we're we're, our, we're by default, we're going to have a name for every element of our array, okay? Just like you would in a database, you have what's called an index, okay? Below that, uh, I have an, another example of a series, and here I have given names. So now look at the first column, doesn't have integers anymore. Now my 52, that number that uh, has name A, and then 67, that has name C, so you get the idea. Okay, so it's a lot like a dictionary, right? In fact, I believe down here, I actually create a pandas data structure with a Python dictionary. So here in box 39, I'm creating a series from a NumPy. Not only can you create it from Python lists, Python dictionaries, but you can also create panda series from NumPy arrays. That's perfectly fine. Again, it's built on NumPy, pandas is. Okay, and you see there the output, and then here I here I have a, a a pandas series for strings. Just to remind you that pandas is not just for numbers. Okay, and you see there again the index, and then below I have I went all out. I have string, textual data. I have people's names, and I've given the I've I've given the to make it clear what what those pieces are, I've, now you see first name, the middle name, middle na row, that row is the middle name, and the last. All right, so you get the idea of how you would use this, and how it is a lot like using a database table. And then below that, I have some examples of how you access uh, specific rows and columns. Okay. Here I'm accessing pieces of the. Oh, here well, I'm still on sequences, so I'm just at, here I'm accessing a piece by the position like a Python list, but I'm also accessing it by a, pieces by a name like a Python dictionary, okay? And then below that I do what's called slicing so I can retrieve more than one element at the same time, okay? And then now let me get into data frames. This is n-dimensional data structure, so here you see I've created a two-dimensional, you might call it a matrix of numbers in this case. Below that, I have a matrix of textual data, okay? And I get, notice for this example, remember for my series, every element had a name along the left column, in the leftmost column. Here, um, here, you, here we're, we're not only naming in one dimension, we're naming in two dimensions. That's why you have the zero, one, and two along the left column and the top first row, okay? 
and then below that, as I said, a textual data frame. And then below that, I've, I've explicitly given my own custom names to different rows and columns. So let me show you that here, okay? So you see there in box 48 what I was talking about, okay? So just like in a database table where every column has a name and a type, okay? And then below that, I just have some quick examples of how to access specific rows and columns. Okay, so here I'm calculating row, the row that I named B, right? If you look above, you see there B has 44, 55, and 66. Now I've just extracted just that piece, right? This would be a series, right? We call the series a one-dimensional pandas object. So I've extracted a series from the data frame, you could say. And then below that, I can only I can access it not only from the name, but also from an index, and you can do slicing, all right? And rows as well as columns. And so again, I'll I'll share this with anybody that wants wants to, to see it after our, my talk. But again, you see the index, columns, you can specify all the names of your rows, your columns. Uh, what do you got? You can see here I'm setting a in box 57, I'm setting a specific element. Okay, I, I think this is row, the row named B and the column named F. The element in that specific location, I want to set it to this big number with all sevens. And so I've printed the before and after, and you can see there how the, mate, the data frame changed in that, only in that one position there. Okay, row B, column F. Okay, and then below that, I'm setting a... Uh, what am I doing here? I'm setting one dimension to new data. No, excuse me. I am adding. I'm adding a new column. So, I, so if you look at the before and after below, all of a sudden this column G just showed up. All right. So that's how easy it is to add columns. Okay. Uh, here I'm removing a column. That's fine too. And so look at the before and after. Column disappeared. Uh, here, I, I'm doing a transpose. You can do a transpose of data. Uh, here, I have data that has a string in it as well as numbers. And Python can do a transpose just like we did for the, num the numerical transpose in NumPy. That's fine. OK, we're flipping the data over the diagonal, if you remember my explanation there. All right. And so, yeah. So, so. Python, NumPy builds on Python, and Pandas builds on NumPy. So highly recommend you learn those tools if you are serious about doing machine learning, all right? Let me talk about one last thing, and then uh, that will we'll wrap it up. So Jupyter Notebooks. So what's going on there? Let's say a little bit about that to get us, get you started on Jupyter Notebooks. Fortunately, I've already been demoing Jupyter Notebooks because the, that browser page where I was showing you the, the Python, NumPy, and Pandas code, that was a Jupyter Notebook. So you already have experience with what in the world that is. Okay? So what can we say about Jupyter Notebooks to help you with your education? So it is a browser-based interactive, it's browser-based interactive language shells. So a shell is a program that lets you enter commands, talk to the computer. So it's a, a language shell, so you can pick a language and then type commands in what that language. Originally it was just Python, but now you can do other languages in addition to Python. Okay, where did it come from? So I've, ac I've actually met the creator of Jupyter Notebooks, so let me tell you that story. So if you've used Python for a while, you may have heard of an interactive interpreter called IPython. You heard of that? Okay. So I was at a scientific Python conference at Caltech in Pasadena, California, and Fernando Perez was there, and he said that he thought that the, the default Python interpreter was kind of wimpy, didn't have a lot of features. Okay. It, it didn't save your history among other features that he wanted. So he, he built his own super featureful interpreter and he called it IPython, Interactive Python. And so then he kept adding more and more, making it cooler and cooler and more powerful. 
and that is what evolved into Jupyter Notebooks. And if you remember, if you if you remember my demo, I had boxes where I was entering code and you were seeing output. That's a lot like a Python interpreter, isn't it? Okay, so you can you can see how the Python interpreter and IPython grew and morphed into a Jupyter Notebook. Okay, so that's why I say it's a browser-based interactive language shell. So that's where that came from. Now. Why would you care about using, when would you use Jupyter Notebooks? They're great for doing small, fast experiments. All right. So if you wanted like the, those, all those demos I, you, you saw of NumPy and Pandas uh, objects, if you wanted to tweak the data, I, let's say I, I access the first row. You want to see what, if you can access the second row. You want to change an element. If you just want to do really quick experiments like that, uh, Jupyter Notebooks are really wonderful for doing that. Okay. Also, if you want to combine graphics and videos, plots in along with your code, like for example, doing a presentation. Okay. So. I tried to run a YouTube video, which I, I think it's blocked here at the library, but regardless, um, if you want to embed a YouTube video with your source code, you can do that, okay? I, I, I doubt you're gonna be able to add a JPEG, a PNG, to the comments of your favorite language, okay? So source code is not gonna cut it. If you wanna present, if you wanna do a, a sophisticated presentation, you're probably going to need a Jupyter Notebook, okay, if you're talking over code. So you can put the the results of running the code, put some plots, videos, some notes to yourself. You could basically use a Jupyter Notebook like a PowerPoint, right, by adding lots of presentation data, text, okay. So that's another uh, use that you might have for Jupyter Notebooks. Now, let me tell you about some jargon that you'll hear, okay? So, I said that it's a language shell, so you're obviously going to have to have a language process, language program running somewhere accessible by your notebook in order for your notebook to run commands in that language. So, the Jupyter Notebook has what are called kernels, okay? There's a Python kernel. There's a um, Java kernel, there's a Ruby kernel, a Go kernel. So you can find kernels and then you, you install that kernel in your Jupyter Notebook. And then the same way that I was demoing Python code, you can demo code in whatever uh, language you have a kernel for, okay? Now, I'm always gonna be honest with you guys, so, Jupyter Notebooks are cool, but they're not as important as Python, NumPy, and Pandas. Okay, why do I say that? So, if you have time to learn Jupyter Notebooks, great. Okay, um, you will get some return for your investment. It's just not going to be uh, you, the investment, the return you're going to get from investing time in Python, NumPy, and Pandas. Okay, so I, the only reason I say that if, is if you have trouble installing it on your laptop if you want to run it locally there was a question about the out right if there's a, if something bugs you about notebooks uh and you just don't want to bother with it you it's not essential is what i'm saying okay so just keep that idea in the back of your mind it's cool if you can get it to work but uh, don't sweat it too much okay um i mentioned that you can run lots of experiments there is one issue you need to be aware of Remember, I had all those boxes of different code snippets. If you start running those boxes out of order, you can you can confuse yourself. And I'm going to show you an example of that. Okay, uh, you the Jupyter notebook will remember the history of what you did. It'll remember what's called the state, and then you could forget or not know what state is being saved, and then you could get a confusing result. So. The answer to that is what I always do. It's the same answer whenever your PC or phone is giving you trouble, just reboot it, okay? You can, you can restart the kernel, okay? 
just like you restart a laptop and that will fix a lot of your problems. In fact, I used to work for a help desk and truth be told, 80% of the problems could be solved just by rebooting the computer or the printer. All right, a reboot fixes everything. Now, the reason why a reboot fixes everything is because the state somewhere is getting messed up on your phone or printer or laptop. Somebody wrote a, remember I talked about memory management, how painful it is, we don't wanna do manual memory management. Somebody may have done, one reason somebody may have done memory management and messed up in their C++ code. So now you have to reboot your program every couple days, whatever, okay? So the point is the state can be problematic and it shows up everywhere. And if people wrote perfect software, maybe we wouldn't have to always worry about state so much, but we do, okay? So rebooting is your friend, all right? All right, so let me now, and that comes from a lot of uh, painful experiences that I share that with you. So I don't want you to have the same trouble. All right, so now let me show you, uh, make, show you some stuff about Jupyter Notebooks. All right, so um, actually I've already showed you, my whole talk has been, you've seen a lot of Jupyter Notebooks, but let me just show you the state issue that I was talking about. All right, so look at here, box 61. So A equals one, and then box 62 asks me, or asks, does A plus A, so does one plus one equal two? And the yes, true, okay, so no surprise there. And then below that, I've set A equal to zero, okay? So now, let's, so that's the state, the, uh, the new state of the box somewhere in memory that holds the value of A now has a zero in that wooden box, all right? So now let's go back here, one plus one is still two. Let's come here and let's run this program, uh, this box. All of a sudden now one plus one doesn't equal two anymore, okay? And you're sitting there, oh my God, what's going on? Again, it's that state problem I was talking about, okay? What I would do if I was you, is again, just blow everything up. That's a lot of fun. So I'm gonna come here on the kernel, okay? Restart everything, rerun everything. Do you really wanna do that? Yes. And then a few seconds, one plus one is two again, okay? So that's what I mean, that's your friend, okay? And then um, the very last thing I wanna show you here is a machine learning demo with uh, um, some AWS services. So if you are interested in pursuing uh, learning about machine learning, you wanna use Python, NumPy, and Pandas, there's, uh, you might wanna look into some cloud platforms. So um, all the big companies are getting into machine learning. They know how important it's gonna be. And so Google, Amazon, Microsoft, uh, their Azure cloud platform, GCP, Google Cloud Platform, AWS, Amazon Web Services, they all have wonderful tools. And so, uh, and those tools use what I've been talking about. So here I've logged into my AWS, my Amazon Web Services account. I, I, I asked Amazon, give me a notebook. Let me, help me set up some notebooks for my talk. And that's what I did. So everything I was running here was on the Amazon, uh, AWS platform, because I'm too lazy to bother figuring out how to install Jupyter Notebooks on my laptop. And uh, yeah, and so um, you can look there. Also, there's lots of wonderful libraries that AWS has that, that uh, run specific machine learning algorithms, and they all use NumPy and Pandas. So here's an example. I'm not gonna go through too much, but this is a uh, supervised learning model that trains on bank customer data. It's a classification model and it predicts whether customers will order new certificates of deposits or not. So are they a customer we wanna be uh, schmoozing more, okay? And so um, again, if you wanna see this, I can share this, this source code, but it uses a AWS the AWS has access to an open source library called XGBoost. It's an ensemble learning library, if you know what that is. Um, but I just wanna, let me just highlight one thing. So here I have real machine learning code in a notebook. It has NumPy arrays. It has uh, pandas, 
arrays, okay? And I feed all of this to AWS's classifier using all the libraries, tools I've just been talking about. And Okay, and then I, I run that box, just like I run, I was running the cells previously. I can run all this machine learning code in a box. And then below that, you see there the output. Okay, and if I scroll to the bottom, then uh, I ran this beforehand because I think it takes like five minutes to run. And I didn't think you wanted to wait and see. And then you see there at the bottom, or at the end of my source code, I print the accuracy. So it's almost 90%, okay? And so, yeah. And so if you, uh, I, I, again, I would, uh, uh, I'm not claiming you'd wanna do your development in a Jupyter notebook. I'm only doing this to present it. Uh, but having done your notebook, having done your machine learning program in VS Code or Vim, whatever you like, now you could potentially come here and try tweaking parameters and rerunning things very easily and do those quick experiments I was talking about. Okay, so um, yeah, so that's that's all I have. Um, and again, we'll be doing these every month, and I'm going to record be recording these, so I'll, you can access the recording later if you like. I'll be sharing the content. Me and Tom will figure out how to do that. And again, we, we invite you guys to come in person and join us afterwards at IHOP. We'll be continuing the party there. We wanna keep learning from each other. And uh, yeah, is there, so that's all I have. Uh, is there any questions? Anybody have any questions on anything at all on anything I've talked about? Uh, yeah, so any advice? So keep coming to these talks. <laughs> can I, can I, can I give that answer? What part of my answer? Uh, yeah, I'm, uh, you learn some statistics, learn some linear algebra, try to implement a lot of, a lot of the basic algorithms and I'll, I'm going to go through and show you what the basic algorithms are in upcoming months. Uh, you want to know about neural networks. Uh, that's taking the world by storm and what that's all about. Uh, but then there's simpler methods, random forest, uh, deci decision trees. You'll, there's lots of jargon. You may, that, for that, you might want to get a book or f there's probably a free book online. I'm sure Tom knows one. Uh, yeah, and, the, and just start looking at the, the basic stuff. And again, I'm going to be going over what I think is the most important stuff as well. Oh. Yeah, so actually, I, 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 so that, I'm glad you asked that question. So remember, Python is for data analytics. It's for the manager or the CEO that's grinding through a lot of data to, to answer some question. So it has lots of great, um, it, you, you can easily slurp in some CSV column separated values, uh, JSON data, lots of different formats. It, it expects that you'd have data coming from lots of different places and uh, it can, it can, you can ingest it very easily. Python. Right, right, but yeah. Yeah, so Python has you, Pandas has you covered there. Right, right. Yeah, so the, so, okay, so the kernel, is, if you look in the upper right, the, the name of the specific kernel is Conda, Python 3. So Conda is just a, a uh, Python 3 package that has a lot of libraries that are wrapped, come with it by default. Um, and so, yeah, so the kernel just happens to, to be the Conda Python 3. Yeah, Anaconda. Right. Yes. 
yeah and so uh if i was oh, like here look change kernel so you can see here if i wanted to run a python 2 kernel i don't know why i'd want to do that yeah okay All right oh there's an r look at the first kernel is r that's a uh st good statistics language people use that for machine learning as well okay so yeah there's a lot to learn um yeah keep practicing i'm learning too i'm willing to keep learning with you uh happy to keep the conversation going uh, as as tom said we're going to have i think a slack channel and yeah so we yeah so we we want yeah we want to all work together we 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 had a we had a, a dry spell because of COVID, but we want to bring all the talent in the Woodlands area together and let's all start helping each other and uh, let's get uh, excited about machine learning. Yes. Yes, so so that we're here for you guys. So definitely we want your feedback. So. So tell us things you're interested in. Obviously, keep asking questions during the talks, and we'll try to tailor it to be as helpful as possible. All right, so yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. I'm, yeah. And there's, uh, I mean, it's hard to keep up with all this stuff. I, this is, I saw some, maybe you guys know more about, about it than I do, but now there was a machine learning program. You could take a, a photograph and it could generate a 3D model from it um virtual reality you know from a photograph wham bam it makes the 3d version so it seems like every day there's new cool stuff right yeah so that's that's another thing that's cool is, is, is as we all talk to each other we can help each other keep up with all that's happening so all right so i'm going to thank everybody again uh, that for joining us and i'm going to stop the recording and please uh revisit our website the meetup again and uh, keep in touch as we set up more tools more ways to communicate and uh yeah so hopefully i'll see you again for next month's talk all right thank you for coming bye-bye <laughs>